make sure. Yeah, I'm on. <laughs> I flip. I flip the right switch. That's always a good thing, isn't it? When you do that. Yeah. I'm not gonna sing. <laughs> Uh, you know when I found out that your uh, uh, your music leader is uh, was born in New Orleans, I was looking for the brass band. <laughs> I'm glad to be here with you. It's like the lightning bug that backed into a fan. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, so glad, uh, Greg. Thank you for that gracious introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, nothing matters except just the one thing. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I uh, sent a cheat sheet to help them. Woo! There you go. I sent a cheat sheet to help them get through the slides, you know, because sometimes I get going and it's hard for them to keep up with where I am. But uh, uh, I, I put a title on there that ended up in the bulletin. You notice it says part, <laughs> part something or other like that. That's because I'm writing a book right now entitled uh, Christ the head of the church and one of the chapters is about what I'm going to speak to you about today so that got snuck in there uh, the title is just it's what you do okay it's what you do and uh, I want you to think about that today we're going to look at John chapter 9 as it says on the screen it's where we're going to take our uh, inspiration of the Lord from today uh, and so if you will, and can and will, if you'll stand with me, we're going to read together uh, John chapter 9, the first seven verses. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated today. Uh, to just sort of put things in context of what's going on with Jesus at this point in time, uh, he had just been at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, it's an interesting thing that uh, when he was planning on going to this feast, first of all his brothers, his half-brothers on earth tried to, wanted him to go to that feast uh, in order to become more popular. <laughs> and he, he sort of rejected that, but then he did end up going to the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, while he was there in teaching, he was questioned by, uh, by a teacher of the law. And uh, uh, he, he had healed a man on the Sabbath previously, and that had so upset the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sanhedrin that they were plotting to kill him. Uh, and so what does he do? <laughs> he's back in Jerusalem again. It is on the Sabbath again. And he's healing a man again on the Sabbath. Je Jesus is sort of brave that way, right? Uh, on the picture here you see uh, this is the archaeological dig of the Pool of Siloam where this happened. So this is not a story. This is a real place uh, in time and uh, uh, you can go and visit there today. They continue to ex excavate there and to find new things. Also at that pool of Siloam uh, in the next slide you find that uh, uh, I was there one time and the guy came out. He just, you know how they spray over a, a thing to get the dirt off of stuff and he came out with a handful of coins from the first century uh, 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 or, or even in B.C. time, uh, it's hard to tell, Roman coins. But it's a real place. But you know in this story what we find today is this. Jesus did not focus on the rules of the Sabbath day. His focus was on changing people's lives. Amen? 
And, and that's what he still is about to this day. What happens when we truly meet Jesus? Well, we become a witness. It's not, it's not that we have an option there. <laughs> Once you are a follower of Christ, you are a witness. Now, you can be a bad one or a good one, but, but you are a witness. And what we're supposed to do is testify to what has happened in our hearts and our lives to those that are around us. Now, uh, at this point in time, I had a little video I was going to show you, uh, but I don't think uh, it, the technology translated over. So what I was going to show you is some commercials, little clips of commercials that we had a while back uh, 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 in, in a company that will go unmentioned of what the company was. <laughs> but in it, it was showing a husband and a wife arguing over directions. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> you know, us guys, we say, I know where I'm going. Why don't you stop and ask somebody? No, no, you know. Uh, but here's the thing. When you're in a husband and wife, you argue over directions. That's just what you do. Right? It's what you do. Uh, another clip in that would, was about some camels at the zoo. And the people standing at the side were yelling at them, Hey, camel, what day is it? What day is it? Hump day. You know, and, and the thing is, hey, look, uh, if you're a camel, people are going to yell hump day at you. It's just what they do, right? It's just what they do. Another little part of the, in the video uh, from these commercials, it showed... Uh, I believe it's Admiral Perry that first arrived at the, at the South Pole and he arrived there and he was getting ready to plant the flag and Dora the Explorer was there saying, Hi, how are you doing? What took you so long getting here? <laughs> if you're Dora the Explorer, you explore because it's what you do, right? In our thinking today, I want us to think about the fact that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a witness and you testify as to what Christ has done. Why? It's what you do. Well, in John chapter 9, beginning with verse 8, let me go back and let's look at that again. It says, His neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Some said, He's, he's the one. Others were saying, no, he just looks like him. Uh, but the guy kept saying, I'm the one, yeah, it's me. it is me. I am that guy. So they asked him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So when I went and washed, I received my sight. They said, where is he? They asked. He said, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, take, I think that's the feeling of what he said. I don't know. I don't know who, where he is. Here's the thing. If you know Jesus, you are a witness, right? We've established that. And you testify. And here's the first thought. Even if your community challenges you, Right? Now, we, we know what the attitude of the community was toward this guy. We picked it up from the disciples. What did they say? Who sinned? <laughs> this guy or his parents that he was born blind? Uh, obviously, they didn't have much to think about this guy, right? Probably reflecting that the community thought there was something wrong with this guy, some sinful problem that he was born this way. Some people may hesitate to be a witness and to testify because of how they're viewed by their community. They're looked down on for one reason or, or another. The truth is people just don't fully understand a changed life in Christ, right? They think once you're this way, you're always that way. Well, one of the most influential people in my life, uh, in, a man from Kentucky named Daniel Boone Harris. Well, you expect, you know, Kentucky Daniel Boone and all that. But Daniel Boone Harris was the town drunk up until his 30s. That's what he was known as. Never finished school, never learned to read, but he got gloriously saved in the preaching in a revival. 
and it totally changed his life. He never learned to read, but he would have his wife read to him from the Bible. He would memorize it. Never knew anybody knew as much scripture. If you said, Brother Boone, how are you doing? He'll say, happy in the Lord. He was a big old guy. Happy in the Lord. He was a witness everywhere he went. People didn't understand the changed life. And some doubted him and looked down upon him. He didn't let that hinder him. He didn't let the attitude of the community keep him from being the witness that God called him to be. Well, he developed cancer and went to the hospital. And they told him that he had three months to live. Well, already he had learned, because he was always a witness, he had learned that three doctors and seven nurses in that hospital were not saved. So Brother Boone prayed to the Lord, not three months, but give me three years, Father. God gave him three years. He never left the hospital. He was in constant pain. But when he died, three doctors and seven nurses had come to know the Lord. Yeah, no matter what your community might think about you, your job is to testify as to what the Lord has done. His favorite song I used to sing in the gospel quartet a long time ago when I still had hair. That was back in the 1900s, by the way. But uh, anytime we sang and asked for requests, Brother Boone would ask for 10,000 years. You all know that one? 10,000 years and we'll just be started, right? 10,000 years and we've just begun. The battle's over and the victory's been won. 10,000 years and we've just begun, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. If you know Jesus, you are a witness and you testify. It's what you do. Going on in that passage... In chapter 9 of John, in verse 13, looking back at that portion again, they brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. The day that Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. Remember I told you he had already gotten in trouble for doing this, and now he's doing it again. Then the Pharisees asked him again how he received his sight. The man said, he put mud on my eyes. He, he told them, I washed and I can see. Well, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a sinful man perform such signs? And there was division among them. Again, they asked the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? I can picture that he thought just a minute. And he said, he's a prophet. <laughs> well, duh. Of course he is, right? He healed him, didn't he? See, here's the thing. If you know Jesus, you are a witness, and you testify even if you are challenged by religious leaders. Right? Nothing kills a witness more than holier-than-thou religious people. We all know that. According to the Pharisees, there was a whole list of things you can't do on the Sabbath. Now, they weren't in the law. They weren't in the Torah. They weren't in the first five books of the Bible. These are things they made up that they said also you have to keep beyond what the Scripture said. Like they said things like you couldn't fill a dish uh, with oil and put it beside a lamp and put the end of the wick in it. You can't do that on the Sabbath. That's working. You could could not put out a lamp on the Sabbath. Uh, you couldn't go out with sandals that had nails in them. You know what they would do back then? They would put nails in the bottom of them. You got more traction. They last a little bit longer. They said that's too much weight to carry on the Sabbath if you had heavy shoes. Now, some of you ladies would be in trouble. But uh, anyway, too great a burden. You couldn't cut your fingernails or pull a hair out of your head or your beard. I, I, I wouldn't get in trouble about the head part, the beard maybe. But, uh, uh, but that's how silly their rules and regulations are. You know, we make rules and regulations also. And sometimes we think about those as being more important than exactly what the Bible says. 
if we're not careful, our traditions. But here's the thing. If you know Jesus, you are a witness, and you testify, it's what you do. Even if religious leaders don't like what you're doing. Well, if we go on in this passage in chapter 9, uh, verse 18, the Jews did not believe this about him, that he was blind and received sight, until they summoned the parents of the one who had received his sight. They asked them, is this your son, the one uh, you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Now notice how these parents answered. We know this is our son and that he was born blind, his parents answered. But we don't know how, uh, how he now sees and we don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things, listen, his parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him as the Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Here's the thing. If you know Jesus, you are a witness and testify even if your family refuses to support you. Some of you have experienced that. Yeah. Even if your family refuses to support you. Well, the picture that's coming up on the screen <clears throat> has my father in it. He's the one in the baseball uniform. This was way back in the day where every little town had their own baseball club. Uh, I don't know if any of you all are old enough to remember that. I'm not either, but my dad, <laughs> he was pretty well known. He was known as Lewis Sonny Searcy uh, and a baseball player. He was also known because he was a drunk and a gambler. Down by the riverbank, <laughs> Van Buren, Kentucky, where they'd roll the dice where, you know, on the flat side of the river and drink the moonshine. Uh, he was a great baseball player, but uh, his life changed one day when he came home from work and found his five-year-old son, my oldest brother Doyle, who's gone on to glory, was a pastor for 60 years. When he found him at five years of age kneeling by the bed praying for his dad. That began the change in his life. And uh, he got saved in a revival meeting. The Lord called him to be a preacher of the gospel later. Uh, he did that instead of taking a contract with the White Sox. So he was serious about his faith. But here at the beginning when he got saved, his family, some of them surrounding him there in that picture, his family said, give it a few months and he'll be back down by the river gambling and drinking. Well, I got news for them. They know it now because he led most of them to the Lord. After 40 years of preaching, he ended up with cancer in the hospital. And uh, he always wanted to die preaching, he said. So the last 34 hours of his life, he preached and sang to everybody that came into the room. And the theme of the sermon was, hold high the word of God. And he held it up in his hand, the Bible in his hand, and kept preaching until he couldn't hold it up anymore. And then my brother Doyle, that five-year-old that prayed for him, who was a pastor, and myself, who was a pastor at that time, we took turns holding his hand up. And he ended and went into glory preaching. Listen, it doesn't matter what your family might say. The thing is, if you know Jesus, you are a witness and you testify. It's what you do. And that's who we are. Even if your family doesn't understand it. Going on in that chapter uh, 9 of John in verse 24. So a second time they summoned the man who had been blind and told him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Speaking of Jesus, that is. He answered, Whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. <laughs> 
Uh, that, that's the essence of a testimony, isn't it? Uh, I don't know about all these theological things that you're going through here, but one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see, right? Well, they, then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I already told you, he said, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? This guy's getting kind of brave in his faith, right? Once you start testifying, the Holy Spirit makes you braver about it as you go along, right? Here's the thing. If you know Jesus, you are a witness and you testify even if you are threatened. Now, we might not have experienced a lot of that in America, but it's growing. It's growing. You better nail down, this is what I do. Right? It's what I do, no matter what, because people will start to threaten you. Nothing else seemed to be working, so they just decided they would threaten him. The writer, uh, Tamora Pierce, said, threats are the last resort of, of a man with no vocabulary. <laughs> the, uh, threats are the last resort of a man with no vocabulary. <laughs> they, can't, they can't defeat your argument. Right? They can't, they can't uh, debate with you, so they just start threatening you, right? This man asked the Pharisees, uh, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do, you, uh, why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? That's a brave statement in front of people that were already trying to kill Jesus, right? Here's, here's the thing. If you know Jesus... You are a witness, and you testify. It's what you do, even if you're threatened, right? Well, moving on in this chapter in John, in verse 28, they ridiculed him. You hear that? You're that man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciple. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't know where he's from. This is an amazing thing, the man told them. You don't even know where he's from, and yet he opened my eyes. <laughs> we know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. Throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. So they say back to him, you were born entirely in sin, they replied. And are you trying to teach us? Then they threw him out, meaning throwing him out of the synagogue, which was an awful thing for a Jewish person that day. It's like being cast out of the church, right? You can no longer come to church here. Here's the thing. If you know Jesus, you are a witness and you testify even if you are insulted. They just came right out and said what everybody else been thinking, what we saw the disciples have been thinking, that this guy is a, is a sinner. You know, you're born in sin. Obviously, God hasn't blessed you. And obviously, uh, you're not what you should be, right? They just came right out and said it. The threats weren't working, so they turned to insults. If people do not have an answer to what you have to say as a testimony of what Jesus has done for you and Really, nobody can challenge what Christ has done for you, right? Now, for a witness, it's not our job to go out and judge people. God, the righteous judge, will judge people, right? In a law court, he'll be the judge. It's not really our job to convict people, right? The Holy Spirit does that. Jesus uh, said when he comes, he'll convict mankind of sin, righteousness, and the judgment, right? That's the Holy Spirit's job. He's the prosecuting attorney, right? He convicts. Uh, it's not our job to save people. Can you save somebody? I can't. Only Jesus can do that, right? So those are not our jobs. What is our job? To be a witness. What does a witness do? You tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. This is what God's done for me. If you start saying somebody else, you know, judges say hearsay, right? <laughs> if you try to judge the person on trial, uh, he said, that's not your job. It's my job. Our job is to testify as to what Christ has done for us and people cannot argue that. The man, man simply said, I was once blind and now I see. How are they going to challenge that? Because it was the truth and exactly what had happened. 
That's all we do. We let the chips fall where they may. And people might insult us, but you keep on doing it because it's what we do. That's who we are. Why are we surprised that people might threaten and insult and cast us out and all these things that happen? We shouldn't be surprised because Jesus told us it would. In John 16, 2, Jesus says, They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. <laughs> hey, that's what happened to this guy. They cast him out. Jesus says that's what's going to happen, right? They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering a service to God. In our society today, people that attack Christians are trying over and over again to change the scenario that we are the ones who are off and away from God and that we don't know God and we're, we're doing a service for God by shutting down these right-wing conservative radicals, right? Well, Satan has done this all through the ages and Jesus said he would, so we shouldn't be surprised. Here's a question I would ask you. If Christ died for us, why would we not be willing to die for him? Now, let me just ask you a question, and you can actually answer this. What's the worst thing they can do to you? And then what? I go home to the glory and to eternity and no more tears and no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain. Bring it on. <laughs> if that's all you got, you ain't got nothing, right? Well, that's the way it is. Because if you know Jesus, you're a witness and you testify. It's what you do, right? See, Jesus, he is the one we please or don't please, right? He's our master. He's our Lord. Going on in verse 35 in this chapter, Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out of the synagogue, right? And when he found him, he asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? He asked. Jesus answered, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. I believe, Lord, he said, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into the world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do not see will become blind. I want you to notice the progression of this man. Did you notice that in this short story, what the Holy Spirit did in his life from where he was to where he ends up? He starts out there in verse 11 when, the, when they're challenging him. Uh, he just said, the man told me to do this, and so I did it. I went, right? Isn't that the beginning of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? When he asks us to do something, we by faith hear him. We may not understand it, but we do it, right? And then in verse 11, they came to him again questioning him and said, who is this guy? He's grown in faith already. He gives great insight. He is a prophet. He's more than that. He's prophet, priest, and king, right? <laughs> but he is the greatest prophet the world has ever seen. A prophet says, thus saith the Lord. And who better than Jesus said, this is what the Lord says. Everything that proceeded from his mouth. But then in verse 35 through 38 when they start getting real mean with him and asking him uh, about things and, and he got kicked out of the synagogue. Now Jesus shows up. Now I want you to remember he grew in faith in his answers to those guys. He's, he even said, uh, you know, from the scripture, you know, if somebody does this and that, they're bound to be from God. How can they not be from God and do these things? You know, his, his faith and his words, uh, because he was open to what the Holy Spirit was saying, was becoming stronger and stronger. If you want to get better at being a witness, get better at testifying for the Lord, just start doing it because then the Holy Spirit will give you words you never thought you had, right? You just got to do it, right, because it's what we do. But then Jesus came to him and asked him that question. 
And do you believe in the Son of Man? And what did he say? I believe, Lord. And he worshiped him. What a progression in life. From just the point of saying, okay, if you say to do it, I'll do it. To the point of knowing you are the Son of Man. Which means in that Jewish man's mind, you are the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. You are the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He understood it and knew it. You see, if you know Jesus, you are a witness. And you testify. It is what you do. Now as we come to the end of the service today, and in a moment we're going to sing an invitation and Brother Greg will be up here to receive you if you have a decision to make. I always say this, and I'm sure your pastor uh, reminds you of the same thing. Every time you come to a worship service to worship the Lord high and lifted up, uh, the decision time is for you and me and every one of us. The Holy Spirit, if you've come in true worship, will not let you pass seeing God for who He is, seeing yourself for who you are, and not helping you to see that there's some difference there and something that needs to be worked on, right? So the invitation is for all of us today. And Brother Greg will be up here if, if you need to come and make a public decision. Two things today. Many of you here, if not most of you here, if not all of you here, are followers of Jesus Christ. At some point in your life, you've, you've made him Savior and Lord by giving your heart and life to him. As the scripture instructs, you have, you have agreed with God about your sin. That's conviction. You have repented and turned from that sin, repentance and faith. And you have made him not just uh, fire insurance, not just Savior, but also Lord, right? and you've done that in your life, that means you are a witness. The question for you today is how good a witness have you been? It is what you do. You have to testify as to what God has done for you everywhere, every place. I don't know about you, but I believe every one of us that are followers of Jesus can get better at that. Right? Right? Here's the thing to remember, just like in this man's life, every time you do that, every time you recognize it's who, it's who I am, it's what I do, I'm not embarrassed about it. I, I talk about Jesus. I talk about church. I talk about the truth of the Bible. Whenever I'm in a discussion, wherever I might be, at school, at work, or at the store, or whatever, whenever it comes up, that's who I am. That's what I do. Every time you do that, you will have more insight. You will have more power from the Spirit. You will grow in your faith uh, Look how rapidly this man grew. And God will do the same for us. Maybe today you just need to dedicate yourself again to saying, it's who I am. And that's what I'm going to do. The second thing in this invitation today, you have no testimony if you haven't given your heart to the Lord. You have no hope if you haven't given your heart to the Lord. You have no future if you haven't given your heart to the Lord. Unlike this man, you say, I was blind and I'm still blind. But you today can be like this man and say, once I was blind, but I met Jesus. And now I see. And then your testimony can truly begin. If you need to do that today, you need to do it publicly. I'm sure your pastor has shared with you why. Because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven, right? A secret decision is no decision at all. It's like a, the guy driving down the road with his girlfriend in the car, and he says, I love you and everything, honey, but if I see somebody I know, will you duck down? That's, that's, that's a secret, <laughs> you know, relationship. No such thing as a secret relationship with the Lord. That's why we ask people to make it public. Starting here, but it only starts here. Then it goes out to where you work and your family, telling, being that testimony to everybody around you. What do you do when you accept Christ? You recognize that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, as Romans says, right? Me, you, and everybody, we've fallen short. 
you know that the wages of that sin is death. Not just death in this world, that's the curse of sin. Yes, everybody dies, but it's eternal death and separation from God is the result of that sin. What's the good news? The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ who died in your place. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you need to do that today, you need to do it as we sing. Some decisions can be made where you're sitting. Some things you're making a decision about requires public. If it's publicly known, it needs to be publicly confessed, right? So this is the time in the invitation. Let's pray and Brother Greg will come and, and we'll sing on the invitation and we'll be done for today. Our Father, we thank you so much for your Son Jesus who came into this world to save us from our sins. We pray, Father, today that every follower uh, of Jesus in this place will be more dedicated to being that witness and giving their testimony than ever before. And Father, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray, Father, that they may have the courage by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk this aisle and to put their hand in Greg's hand and say, I'm accepting Christ as my Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.